This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Over 700 deaths recorded registered in Brazil in a single day amid rising concerns about the country's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Health Organization asked Madagascar to subject its purported cure of COVID-19 to clinical trials. And we look at what people in Africa are doing to cope with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Searle and Saw live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at other stories making headlines this hour. Ethiopia seeks constitutional interpretation on holding elections in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. And the Egyptian Navy acquires a third German-made submarine. Once again, welcome to Africa Live. We start in Brazil, where the country has set a new daily record of coronavirus deaths with 751 new fatalities on Friday. That brings the country's total death count to nearly 10,000. More than 145,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported so far, with more than 10,000 in the last 24 hours. Brazil closed schools and non-essential businesses on or March 24th and has extended its stay at home order through the end of May. President Jair Bolsonaro is pushing for reopening of businesses, saying their closure is unnecessary and is damaging the country's economy. And Brazil's Amazon region is one of South America's hardest hit areas by the coronavirus. But COVID-19 is not the only medical challenge faced by health workers there. CGTN's Paulo Cabral visited a city in the state of Amazonas and filed this report. These women are fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic. They are community health care agents in the Amazon town of Manacapuru, the city with the highest coronavirus infection rate in the country. They make daily neighborhood rounds to check on residents and give out information on how to defend themselves from the virus. You know what to do, right, Jessica? Just leave your home if absolutely necessary. Let the thing pass and take care of yourself. We work on prevention and orientation. We take to the houses of these people important information that sometimes they don't get from radio or television. It's important for these people. Many of them actually can't read. In this house, nine out of ten family members tested positive for the virus. One family member refused to take the test. Social distancing is not easy in the crowded homes found here. Suspected COVID-19 cases in Manacapuru are sent to this clinic assigned exclusively for such cases. This pregnant woman was showing symptoms of the virus and came in for testing. I was feeling ill and I came to be tested to find out that I caught the virus. I see that a lot of people are dying. My uncle died of this disease. The coronavirus is a new threat that this community health care agents have to deal with here in the Brazilian Amazon. But that's just one addition to the many diseases that these families are already exposed to. Yellow fever, malaria, dengue and Zika are some of the insect-borne diseases that need prevention measures in place to avoid an outbreak. Measles and the various types of influenza viruses, like H1N1, are also recurring problems. Right now, our priority is to locate the people with coronavirus symptoms. The problem is that there are other jobs that the community health care agents also have to do. Of course, we haven't totally dropped them, but the virus has certainly changed our routines. Como a gente está muito focado na questão da... Since our focus on the COVID-19 issue, the attention given to other diseases ends up reduced, so this increases the risk of death in the case of these other diseases. Despite the severity of the coronavirus spread here, social distancing is far from effective in Manacapuru. 
the town is already having a hard time coping with the level of infections. And right now, the situation doesn't seem to be getting any better. Paulo Cabral, CGTN, Manacapuru, Brazilian Amazon. Let's go straight into Africa, where the coronavirus numbers have now surpassed 57,000. South Africa has reported its highest single-day rise in infections after over 600 cases were recorded in the last 24 hours. There are now nearly 9,000 cases in the country, including more than 170 deaths. Meanwhile, Ghana has counted more than 900 new COVID-19 patients in a single day. More than half of these cases were from an outbreak at an, at an industrial facility. Cases in the country are said to have increased after the government eased restrictions in areas hardest hit by the pandemic. This brings the total number of infections in Ghana past the 4,000 mark. And in Egypt, there are now almost 500 new infections, also its highest daily increase. Egypt relaxed some restrictions ahead of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan and shortened a nighttime curfew by one hour. Authorities, however, say they are ready to reimpose rules if the number of infections continues to increase. And let's shift our focus to Madagascar, where a herbal drink known as COVID Organics has generated heated debate. President Andre Rajolina claims it prevents and cures patients suffering from COVID-19. The World Health Organization wants Madagascar to subject the concoction to clinical trials, insisting that its use could be harmful. CGTN's Nick Mundimba reports on the raging debate between conventional and herbal medicine. As the fight against COVID-19 intensifies, countries have rushed to find a cure. In Madagascar, a herbal concussion from Artemisia and other indigenous hubs has caused a national frenzy. Other African countries, among them South Africa, Tanzania, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea and the Republic of Congo, are now showing interest in the Madagascan herbal remedy. I am communicating with Madagascar. A letter has already been written and they say some medicine has been found there. We will send a plane and the meds will be brought so that Tanzanians can benefit too. So as a government, we're working day and night. And not to be left behind, the World Health Organization too. We are advising the government of Madagascar to take this product through a clinical trial and are prepared to collaborate with them. We've also invited them to join the WHO coordinated solidarity trial where other uh, therapeutics are being tested out. The plant was first imported into the island nation in the 1970s from China to treat malaria. I spoke to Dr. Kefa Bosiri, a pharmacologist, about the conventional versus herbal medicine. Not a surprise for traditional healers. And it's not a surprise for people who know about the way herbs are used to manage diseases. There are three things that will stand out. One, they're used in fever. Two, they're used in conditions that seem to promote or create fever. And amongst them, surprisingly, will be even respiratory conditions that have fever. And so the use of atemesia in a respiratory condition that has fever is not abnormal. Yeah, Unmoved by the raging debate, Madagascar has offered to donate the herbal mixture to African countries. Use of um, Artemisia annua by Madagascar and the reaction of African countries has been typical of today's setting. Why do I say that? We do not teach MBCHB or doctors who graduate with a degree in medicine about herbal treatment. The ones who are trained in herbal treatment are pharmacists. And in many settings today, when policies are being formulated, it would be prudent for countries to ensure that they do have the input from the pharmacists who have trained in herbal medicine. President Andrew Rejolina, a former DJ who in 2009, at the age of 34, became the continent's youngest national leader, has reached out to South Africa to support Madagascar in undertaking a scientific analysis of the herbal drink. In the meantime, the World Health Organization has cautioned countries against adopting the product that has not been through clinical tests for safety and efficacy. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. 
Meanwhile, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says at least 19,000 prisoners will be released to help curb the spread of the coronavirus in prisons. Now, this is in response to a United Nations call for countries to reduce the numbers in correctional facilities so that social distancing and self-isolation can be observed. CGTN's Angela Coppola has more. The infection count in South Africa's prisons shows some 95 infected officials and 77 infected inmates. This in a prison system that's overcrowded by around 32%, with the Eastern Cape, Gauteng and Limpopo prisons the most overcrowded. It's the overcrowding that's leading to the spread of the coronavirus, prison officials are telling us. And that's why the government heeded the UN call. Only low-risk offenders, of course, will be considered for parole and it will be done in phases over the next 10 weeks using the parole board system, of course. People with underlying health care issues, offenders over the age of 60, and female offenders with children will go first. Authorities say at the end of the program, overcrowding will have been reduced by around 12.1%. The Justice and Correctional Services Minister, Ron Lamola, says they're also looking at the 5,000 awaiting trial prisoners who can't afford to post bail money, although he didn't provide more details about how they would be dealt with. Lamola says he's not oblivious to the concerns of society about releasing prisoners before they finish serving their sentences. But the move is aimed at protecting the country, as he put it, from the pandemic. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Staying in South Africa, where more than 500 healthcare workers have been infected with the coronavirus, frontline workers are appealing to the government for adequate protective equipment like masks and gloves. Sumitra Naidu reports. It hasn't been easy for healthcare workers in South Africa. The country's public hospitals were already overburdened and under resourced before COVID 19 hit. Now, doctors, nurses, and everyone that's on the front line risk getting the virus. Health workers find themselves having to wake up every morning and go to work emotionally not strong as before. This pandemic has been emotionally, physically, and economically draining and very distressing on health workers. Many healthcare workers don't have enough protective gear and they're afraid to ask for them. We're still finding some healthcare professionals having to fend from them for themselves with getting face masks. We are finding ourselves repeating face masks, um, trying to like, like reuse them on like a four or three day um, span to just make sure that you at least have a mask. Most of the hospitals we don't have PPEs, a personal protective equipment. And when we are infected or we are at high risk of not putting PPEs, we are going home to infect our families, our children, our partners at home. A proper medical mask is specifically designed to filter out any germs that could enter the area. That's why these masks cannot be reused. PPEs availability not only in this country, globally, has been a challenge. So where health workers wake up, go to work without appropriate uh, protective gears. And this has, you know, been going on since the beginning of the pandemic. As a healthcare practitioner, we are very scared. And some of us is that when we are looking for the PPEs, we have already received written warnings from the HODs. So we don't know now who to cry to, who should we tell that PPEs we need them. It's a must. South Africa is now on level four restrictions under the lockdown, which means that some parts of the economy have reopened. Social distancing and curfews are still being enforced, but there is a lot more movement of people than before. There is a concern that the infections will rise more rapidly. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Frontline health workers were among the first to be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In Somalia, CGTN's Abdulaziz Billah spoke to a medical doctor who has recovered from the infectious disease. Let's take a look. Zakaria Abdul Qadir Arale is back at his workstation for the first time in more than a month. The 30-year-old medical doctor is among more than 100 people who have recovered from COVID-19. I was at my workstation dealing with patients who have tested positive for COVID-19. As you can imagine the risk involved, that's when I contracted the virus after coming into contact with a sick patient. 
waxa ku talagalaysa in aad Zakaria was among a dozen people mainly health workers who tested positive for the virus in March He works at the case management section at the Di Martino Hospital the country's sole treatment unit for COVID-19 the disease hit us by surprise and this is the reason why medical workers were the first to test positive for the virus. We are the first line of defense because we treat the sick no matter their condition. For days, Zakaria remained asymptomatic in self-isolation at his home in Mogadishu. Throughout this period, he maintained contact with the outside world and his colleagues at the hospital through social media and messaging apps. A medical doctor is the first person to come into contact with a patient, the first person at risk of contracting the virus. I work at the COVID-19 treatment center, and just like other developing nations, frontline medical workers have become sick with the disease. Health officials have announced a spike in the number of infections in the country. Private hospitals across much of the country have been accused of failing to report patients with COVID-19 symptoms early enough. Health officials say they are seeing an increasing trend where COVID-19 patients arrive at this hospital while in critical condition, providing doctors at this designated COVID treatment unit with few chances of saving their lives. Now, fully recovered and in good spirits, Zakaria hopes to use his experience as an example that the disease can be defeated, provided people comply with health directives. <laughs> Just like any other disease, the recovery rate is high. It is sad that some people have lost their lives. I am a living example that the virus can be defeated, and this is why I have returned to work to help my people. The virus has already claimed more lives in the country, making it the worst affected nation in East and Horn of Africa. However, key lessons are yet to be learned, with crowds continuing to be seen in markets and places of worship. Some top health experts are warning that the worst is yet to come. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Tunisia has eased some of its coronavirus lockdown measures. Authorities are now faced with the challenge of ensuring people respect health and safety regulations aboard public transport. CGTN's Adnan Shawashi reports from Tunis. Tunisia's transport ministry has deployed hundreds of security and safety agents and officers to ensure that social distancing is respected. They also enforce other health and safety regulations. We do not authorize any passenger to enter the central station without wearing a face mask. We only allow a limited number of persons inside to avoid congestion at the gates. Tunisian railways are strict about implementing the measures of the targeted lockdown. The company has made face masks and hand sanitizers available while limiting the number of passengers in buses trains and metros. The organization is perfect here. Hand sanitizers are available. Social distancing is respected. I do not mind following the sanitary measures because it's important for public health. The state has provided more means of transport. However, Tunisian passengers say the huge number of passengers is an obstacle. It's impossible to avoid congestion, especially during the rush hour. Both the bus and the train were packed this morning. It will remain as such in the afternoon. The one meter distance is only respected along routes to some destinations. The disinfection of the public transport network is a daily operation that will continue until the end of the pandemic. It aims to limit the number of new infections. The Ministry of Transport has estimated that one million people will use public means this week. However, 2.2 million passengers have used public transport in the first phase of the targeted deconfinement in the North African state. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. And let's turn our attention back to South Africa, where a South African liquor company, Distel, has started using some of its alcohol to produce much-needed hand sanitizers. The firm cannot sell any of its liquor domestically due to a sales ban during the lockdown. Renee Del Carm has that story. It's week six of South Africa's coronavirus lockdown. And the government's crackdown on the sale of alcohol has led to a difficult period in the liquor industry. We're one of the few countries that has imposed a very stringent, full uh, prohibition of alcohol sales in our country. So 
the impact on our industry is dramatic. What we chose to do is make a, a quantity of 165,000 litres of hand sanitizer, of which 100,000 litres, now actually 112,000 litres, will be going for free to needy communities through the Department of Health, through the Department of Transport and also through the local provincial departments to needy communities and the vulnerable in South Africa. We also intend sending more of this hand sanitizer into Africa where we know those needs are just as big. This is one of the cells alcohol beverage producing plants where ciders, wine coolers and other spirit and wine products are manufactured. For the past four weeks though, it's been repurposed to blend hand sanitizer with an alcohol volume of 70%. The alcohol we use from our other products, our whiskies and our brandies, we've now used for blending hand sanitizer. Um, and based on the World Health Organization recipe for, for hand sanitizer, we add glycerin and hydrogen peroxide uh, and a, a bit of demineralized water and make the hand sanitizer. The company hopes that South Africa will be able to strike a balance between curbing the spread of COVID-19 and reopening the country's economy in the not too distant future. We're all in this together, trying to solve a very, very challenging societal health risk on the one hand, and actually keeping our economies and jobs afloat at the same time. And that's no easy task. The team that's working here are all volunteers from our, from our workforce. Um, and for me, it's very heartening to see so many guys willing to come out in this dangerous time to blend hand sanitizer for fellow employees, fellow South Africans, and even for, for uh, people in the African continent. The Stills hand sanitizer will soon be exported to other parts of Africa where it's needed the most. Rene Dalcom, CGTN, Paul in South Africa's Western Cape province. And with more news coming out of South Africa, the Nelson Mandela Foundation has been supporting financially vulnerable communities. It partnered with several organizations to provide food parcels and other necessities. CGTN's Yulisa Njabela tells us more. The lockdown that has been put in place by President Cyril Ramaphosa to help curb the spread of the coronavirus has left many families destitute. Among those who are most affected are the elderly, those who are informally employed and child-headed households. Through the Each One Feed One campaign, the Nelson Mandela Foundation wants to encourage South Africans to take action and play their part in the fight against the spread of COVID-19. The initiative seeks to bring relief to the plight of food insecurity during and after the crisis faced due to the pandemic and the lockdown. The big idea behind it is that uh, if each individual, each family, each community look after one another, we won't have anyone living in South Africa who would then go hungry. And we are hoping that uh, more and more people will, will come on board. Each One Feed One campaign is specifically targeting the most vulnerable households. Often we, we don't realize the need is so great and so deep. And in a community such as Orange Farm, which is really on the outskirts of Gauteng, we realize that there are people here in desperate need. It's really important that in a pandemic like this, we're able to really connect with these people and we're able to touch their lives in a small way by giving them of these packages. The centres that we are supporting are centres that are looking after um, children uh, that, uh, that are vulnerable, families that are vulnerable. And so we have carefully selected those uh, as a way of, uh, of reaching out to these communities and helping them uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the food parcels. The food hampers that are being distributed will help support these families for at least three months. When you see the, the gratefulness on, on, on the people's lives and when they come and pick up their food, it's just a blessing to see that this great work is getting to the people that need it most and to the actual people on the ground, and that's a, that's a big plus. Many more families in all provinces will benefit as the Each One Feed One campaign will be taken all over the country to help many other families. Yuli Sanjamela for City to n in Orange Farm, South Africa. And our coverage continues on Africa Live. Here's a look at what's ahead. 
Ethiopia seeks constitutional interpretation on holding elections in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. And the Egyptian Navy acquires a third German-based, German-made submarine. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Africa Live. Let's head over to Ethiopia. Opposition parties have been strongly opposing the indefinite postponement of this year's general election. The National Electoral Board cites the coronavirus pandemic as the reason behind this decision. The country's parliament has voted to seek a constitutional interpretation on the issue. CGTN's Gary Chala has the details from Addis Ababa. This September, Ethiopia's government in power will conclude its tenure in office and a general election must be held at least a month before that for citizens to decide who takes over the reins of power. But it is not that simple. The scheduled Ethiopian general elections has been postponed indefinitely due to the coronavirus spread. Before our decision to postpone this election, we had several discussions with our health experts and we sought the analysis and prediction on when we can proceed with the plan. The response was that we cannot have any form of elections preparation in April, May or even beyond. Following this announcement and after prominent opposition leaders insist that the general election must be held as scheduled, Ethiopia's parliament has been offered several options to avoid a political crisis. Among the four options offered is the dissolution of the parliament, declaring a state of emergency and seeking a constitutional interpretation. The lawmakers eventually voted to endorse the latter and the work of constitutional interpretation will be done by the House of Federation, which will help decide the next course of action. Many citizens, however, agree the general election in Ethiopia must not be held at this time. They say the government should use all its resources to tackle COVID-19. I support the decision of postponing the elections. Given the coronavirus pandemic, it is difficult to stage a credible and an all-inclusive election. The COVID-19 pandemic is not only our problem, but also one for the rest of the world. Therefore, the decision of postponing this election is not only correct, but it is also fair for everyone. If there are no people, who will benefit from the election? Already, the Tigray region, which forms part of the federal government, has decided to hold elections on its own, regardless of parliament's decision. And it looks like the country's electoral board has yet another challenge to deal with. Grumchala CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Staying with Ethiopia, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has responded to the opposition parties accusing him of delaying the elections in order to stay in power. Abiy says the call for a transitional government is an attempt by the opposition to grab power easily. He has warned that his government will take all necessary measures to protect the constitutional or order in the country. <laughs> The idea of forming a transitional government is invalid, not only from a legal point of view, but also from a consideration of the existing reality, as well as our experience with transitional administration. Even worse is the challenge of COVID-19, coupled with the danger being seen in our region, that makes the idea of forming a transitional government even unwise. This is irresponsible. It's not only illegal, but also dangerous. 
What we want to build is a constitutional democracy. This means that the constitution must be respected and implemented. However, without a constitutional backing, any attempt to get power is absolutely unacceptable. Our constitution on Article 50 primarily puts the mandate of protecting the constitution, and to serve this purpose of protecting the constitutional order, we are prepared to take any necessary measure. Doing this is a job we do based on the constitution and with no negotiation. The United Nations mission in South Sudan has expressed concern over the slow implementation of the country's peace deal. Parties to the country's 2018 peace agreement formed a cabinet in February, but have since failed to proceed with setting control. One proposal on the table has President Salva Kiir's group controlling five states, opposition leader Riek Machar's group taking three, and other political groups sharing the remaining two. However, President Kiir's group disagrees because the peace deal provides that it gets 55% of the states, it says, it should control six of South Sudan's ten states. If we agree on this uh, formula, the overwhelming opinion now is that it should be five, three, one, one. Then we'll start discussion as to which state goes to whom. For example, if I am getting one state, which among the ten states? The United Nations is urging the parties to expedite the implementation of the peace deal. It's very, very important that the momentum continues. Um, and we are growing a little concerned that some of that momentum is slowing. In particular, um, the appointment of governors. It's very important that these governors across the country are appointed because they are the authority in their respective states. At the moment, we're seeing an, up, an increase of intercommunal violence, and uh, some of that is because the, the uh, governors are not there to try and um, to, to, uh, to stop it. The old National Assembly was supposed to be dissolved as soon as it ratified the 2018 peace deal, but that has not yet been done, and the new parliament is yet to be reconstituted. Nobody can argue that because the, the new one has not been agreed the old one cannot go. This does not apply on parliament. In all democracies, parliaments are dissolved 60 days, you know, before the election. So the period of the election, there is no parliament. But you cannot say that uh, there will be a vacuum if the transitional national legislative assembly is dissolved. It doesn't apply. The various political groups here say there won't be any progress in forming the other organs of the government unless the issue of states are resolved. That's because it is only when states are allocated to each party that the parties would decide who should be appointed to key positions. Another unaccomplished task in the peace deal implementation is the unification of the various armed groups, retraining and redeployment of joint forces. That's now suspended as a measure to control the spread of COVID-19. But even prior to the suspension, it was running behind schedule. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. The Egyptian Navy has acquired a third German-made submarine out of four purchased. The country's armed forces say the Navy now has the power to defend Egypt's economic interests along its 2,000-kilometer-long sea line. CGTN's Adel El Makrui has the details. For 20 days, the new S-43-209-1400 submarine has been navigating from the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean Sea, all the way from Germany to its new base in Egypt. During that time, Egyptian Navy troops have stopped by several friendly countries for military exercises to display the latest addition to their fleet. In the coastal city of Alexandria, celebrations were held to mark its arrival. Residents stood along the Cornish waterfront, watching the whole Egyptian submarine's collection as they guard the Mistral helicopter carrier. In a statement, the armed forces said the 209-1400 has one of the most advanced offensive submarine systems in the world. 
It is equipped with eight torpedo tubes and capacity to carry 14 torpedo missiles. The new submarine is also capable of deploying Navy mines and launch water-to-surface anti-ship missiles. It has a range of 11,000 nautical miles and a top speed of 21 knots. The Egyptian military says the addition of the submarine is a major boost to its naval power. The S-43 is the third submarine Germany has delivered to Egypt as part of a contract for the supply of four. Each is estimated to cost about 250 million euros. Egyptian-German military ties have been significantly increasing in recent years. Egypt's arms purchases from Germany have increased by more than 200% in the past six years. In 2019, Egypt is estimated to have purchased some 800 million euros worth of arms. In the same year, the German parliament has given the green light for Egypt to purchase six Miko A200 frigates in a deal that could provide arms worth 2.3 billion euros. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Many food businesses in South Africa have had to switch to delivery services after weeks of restrictions imposed due to the coronavirus pandemic. CGTN's Julie Shire brings us more on how some restaurants have been coping during this time. Johannesburg's Thunderwalker restaurant is a tourist hotspot. It shut up shop before lockdown when customers dried up. We were heavily exposed to travelers from what we then saw as the source countries of the coronavirus. We actually closed down our on-site business two weeks before the lockdown and moved to delivery because we felt the risk to our staff was less. Then the country was shut down and trading stopped completely. Restrictions are now being eased and for the first time in weeks food can be bought from outside. Orders have been slow to come in, but the Thunder Walker kitchen is once again filled with the aroma of wholesome South African food. We have to change some, some sort of the things. We have to freeze because fresh meals, they are not the same as like the frozen meals. Because in times like these trying times, we still need to get some income. We still need to expand our passion. The food is designed and made with love and care, but prepared so that you will reheat it at home, you know, and have a wonderful dinner. And we believe the heating at home is a really important step in ensuring that there is minimal or no risk of any infection. Meals are then packed and ready for delivery. We use our own staff for delivering. So we of course monitor our own staff, you know, if anybody has any symptoms of anything that looks remotely like an illness, they would not be allowed to deliver. They travel with sanitizer and masks all the time. The process has been very safe with very little human contact. I've already paid for my meal online and it's been delivered to my gate with careful consideration for all parties. Julie Shar, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Let's now turn our focus to our continuing series on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic in Africa. The focus today is how Africans in different countries are coping with COVID-19 measures. And on to Egypt now, our correspondent Adel Al Mahroui visited one young family in Cairo whose life has been turned upside down by the coronavirus lockdown. The situation has been especially difficult for the children, but their mother seems to get the full meaning of when life give you, gives you lemons, you should make lemonade. Let's take a look. Since COVID-19 led to a partial lockdown in Egypt, Dalia Khairi decided to take no risks. She wanted to keep her two children safe by all means. For four weeks, they have not stepped out of their building. I am extremely worried about their safety, of course. I don't give them the option to go out, not even to take a ride in our car around the neighborhood. The maximum they do is to take their bikes and go up to the roof to see the sunlight. Keeping a nine and a five-year-old entertained inside their home for nearly a month is no easy task. It's even more difficult for Dahlia, as her husband's job in Dubai has made him less accessible due to the pandemic. But she realized it's effective to teach the kids a set of new skills. We're spending so much time together, and that has never happened before. 
I started giving them some responsibilities. They started helping with the house chores. They've never done that before. During school, everything was ready for them because they didn't have time. Now they rely on themselves greatly. And whenever that gets boring, she challenges them more. The kids love to eat out at restaurants, but they realize that this was no longer an option. So I introduced the concept of preparing their own meals at home. It turned out to be a great idea, which has made them release a lot of energy. They began simply by preparing sandwiches. Now they're capable of baking cookies and making pizzas under her supervision. They were used to opening the refrigerator door to find the food ready in there. Never have they realized that it consumes a lot of time and effort to make. They started appreciating the efforts I exert in this house more. Being a teacher has so far helped Dahlia survive the pandemic measures. If the government extends the partial lockdown, however, this energetic mother will have to become more creative. Adil Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Elsewhere in Tanzania, the coronavirus pandemic has changed the lives of millions. Relationships have been strained by self-isolation, social distancing and other COVID-19 measures. CGTN's Daniel Kijo tells us how some in Tanzania are coping with these changing times. Godfrey Rugarabamu, known throughout Tanzania as MC Garabi, is one of the country's most popular master of ceremonies. Before COVID-19, he was fully booked for weddings and events. Since the government banned large gatherings, he lost a lot of income that caused him considerable stress. However, he is finding comfort and support at home, especially from his wife. She understood the situation and uh, she just took her time to be my comfort zone. So she played her part very well. And uh, what I can say is my relationship status has been upgraded. Yeah, because most of the time I'm with her. Whilst this couple is enjoying spending time together, psychologist Bupe Mwabenga says not all households have successfully coped with challenges posed by the pandemic. She says people are handling the loss of income, anxiety, fear of illness and changes in lifestyle differently. The negative side is for those who have not been able to contain the, 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 the distress, I think they may have emotionally departed more because they have had enough time to quarrel. And you know, the more you quarrel with the person, the more you emotionally get uh, distant. The government has stopped all schooling, banned sporting activities, discouraged unnecessary movement and asked people to wear masks. While some see this time as an opportunity to rekindle their relationships, for others, it's been a hard time as they deal with loneliness. The mechanics of romance have changed for singles too. Restrictions on movement have pushed some online, looking for any sort of social interaction. You end up looking for exes, you chat with them just to connect. You spend a lot of time chatting with people who really don't care for you. Honestly, since Corona, things are hard because there are times you wish to have a partner. You miss companionship. I get depressed sometimes because I don't have data to get online. I end up bored. The government's advice on social distancing is bringing unforeseen challenges for both couples and singles alike. How those relationships will look after the COVID-19 crisis will depend on how people adapt and whether they find new ways to manage and nurture their relationships. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. And in Kenya, families have been at home for over a month following a partial lockdown and curfew as government fights to control the spread of COVID-19. But staying indoors has brought about its own set of unique challenges. CGTN's Robert Nagila spent time with one family in Nairobi who have developed a coping mechanism. Mommy? Yes. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. For an active family used to the outdoors during normal times, Kenya's partial lockdown aimed at controlling the spread of COVID-19 feels like confinement. It has deprived me of my daily routine. That's, that's basically what it's done, because my day works best if I leave the house at 7 a.m., taking kids to school, and then I go to work and do my thing. And with yeah, schools shut and restrictions on movement in place, it's not been easy on the children either. Now I miss school, which I thought I'd never do. <laughs> 
but, and I'm kind of sick of staying indoors all day. The school term has now resumed and 15-year-old Jennifer is taking her classes online through the app Zoom. Well, I've had to adjust to online schooling, which got, an, which was cool at first, but then it got an kind of irritating real fast. The single mother admits, initially, juggling between the children's schooling and her work was a struggle, but she's found the balance. Oh my goodness, that completely did not work for me. I couldn't get anything done. It's difficult enough getting all my own work done without having to jump up every two and a half minutes. Yeah, as long as people do something creative every day and get their exercise and get out of bed on time, um, school helps. She encourages their creativity and everyone has to do their chores. But after being confined for a long period, she admits the occasional meltdown from a family member and says communication is key. It's not that there's a lot of fights or anything like that. I mean, sometimes people are a bit unhappy with each other, but generally people are good communicators and, they, and, and they're emotionally self-sufficient so that if, you're, if you're, not in, you're not in a good mood, you don't take it out on other people. <laughs> they all agree, however, the experience has brought the family closer. That has not stopped Jennifer from making post-quarantine plans. I plan on seeing a lot of people after this quarantine is over. The experience is not unique to the Mara family. It's one shared by millions of families across the country. The Mara secret? Patience, understanding, space. Robert Nagila, CGTN Nairobi, Kenya. The news continues on Africa Live. We'll see you on the other side of the break with more news. Here's a look at what's ahead. Chinese students in Tunisia complete their Arabic courses despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live, find your voice. Welcome back. A group of Chinese students have, their, have, have finished their Arabic courses at the Tunis Carthage University despite challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. CGTN's Adnan Shawashi has the details. The COVID-19 crisis has interrupted the academic year in Tunisia. Hence, the professors and their students were forced to adapt by offering online credits. This program is unprecedented in the North African country. The online courses during the pandemic have many advantages. Anyone can study hard at any time and anywhere. There are no barriers to learning and education. The students can interact with their teachers through the Internet. The head of the Arabic and Translation Department at Tunis Carthage University and the academic coordinator of Chinese universities says the students have shown rigor, discipline and dedication throughout the academic year. The distance learning for our Chinese students was successful. They were always in contact with the lecturers during the general lockdown. We ensured the students' safety while they were finishing the curriculum. It was challenging, but we succeeded together. The students assert that their experience in Tunisia was very rich on the human and academic levels. 
they will all continue learning Arabic while in China. I love the Arabic language which I discovered in China. Now I can improve my level by studying online with my Tunisian teachers. Technology has revolutionized the way people teach, study and communicate. The 28 Chinese students arrived in Tunis in September. They have been repatriated to China to complete their studies at the prestigious universities of Beijing, Tianjin and Dalian. The academic exchange between Tunisia and China has been reinforced in recent years. Hundreds of Chinese students are studying Arabic language here in the capital city Tunis, while Tunisian students are learning Chinese language, culture and literature in China, even during the coronavirus pandemic. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected millions around the world daily lives in more ways than one. This has forced many to adapt and discover different ways of working, learning and connecting with others as CGTN's Julie Shire reports. Many people around the world are doing their part and staying home to try to flatten the curve. But just because we're housebound doesn't mean that we can't learn new skills. Since South Africa's lockdown, many have had to adapt new ways of doing businesses. Artist Leonie Brown was used to a studio filled with students. Social distancing has kept them away, but digital platforms are connecting many and keeping creativity alive. I've seen it as a great opportunity to change things. I think um, as a society, as a global world, we're going to have to relook how we do things. So I've seen it as a way to uh, look at teaching in a different manner. My students that I regularly have on a weekly basis are obviously used to having one-on-one -on -one with me in the class, physically sitting with them, showing them. So it's been a little bit tougher to do that online. But what I've done is I've used Zoom and WhatsApp. Tanya Ilyanov is a busy mom of three. She started painting lessons with Leonie last year, but she didn't get enough time to develop her skill fully. Art is my new skill that I'm really learning. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think I think one can definitely try and, and branch herself out in different areas. The nice thing about Leonie and her art classes is that she always inspires you to be unique and brings out what you want to do, um, where she's not trying to teach her way of doing something. So I think it is, it, it's special to be able to work on something and just bring out that love of what's inside of you and exploring new things. The coronavirus has changed everyone's life and forced many to do things differently. I've had to come up with a plan, get a different camera, borrow one, put it on five tins to get the right height, you know. You make do, but I think that's wonderful, you know, to come up with uh, alternative solutions. These unprecedented times have given some time to polish up old skills. I played the piano a lot when I was younger, like a lot younger. Um, took some lessons there, but then I haven't, just because of school and work and sport, I just haven't been able to play as much as I would like. And I, during this quarantine, I've obviously had a lot of free time on my hands, so I have used that. And I've learned a lot of new stuff, gotten better, and yeah, good times. People may be stuck at home, but that doesn't mean that they're powerless. They can use this time to learn new tools and achieve their goals. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Africa Live. Find your voice. And let's talk a bit of sport. The delayed Tokyo Olympics are to proceed with no plan B, and that's according to senior International Olympics official John Coates. The International Olympic Committee and the Japanese government postponed the Games this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. The Games are now scheduled for July next year. But with climbing infection rates and potential vaccines still in early stages of testing, questions are being raised about whether to further delay the huge sporting showpiece. Australian Olympic Committee CEO Matt Carroll said that the country's athletes were planning and working on the basis that there would not be a vaccine by the time of the Games. And all our team planning and work with the uh, athletes is on the basis, as John just said, that there won't be a vaccine. Um, and therefore the protocols will be in place. So that's, that's the approach we take. The athletes just like that certainty and uh, they're still preparing hard, working hard at, uh, for the Games. 
The, the thing that they are, would like to know more about very soon is the um, ability of, for the, the international federations for the final qualifications. And that's, that's starting to come out now through the uh, IOC and that's what uh, the athletes are looking forward to knowing and when those competitions will be. We've got a task force at the IOC, a task force in um, Japan. Uh, this is a massive exercise and um, we are working through now getting the same venues, the same 43 venues. Uh, we've got the same dates, so the same scheduling. Um, we're doing all of that and um, uh, it's a, you know, we're proceeding on, on the basis that it will. There is no plan B of deferring the games again or anything like that. And Tottenham Hotspur forward Song Hyung Min has completed his three-week military training in South Korea. The 27-year-old